Hey everybody, John Brood here. Hey, I am going to do a video today on wild clay and uh, sort of how to find it and sort of how to process it and uh, run shrinkage bars. And, and the reason I say sort of is because I'm just going to sketch it out here. There's no way I can do it all and do it justice in the, about half hour is what I usually do these videos. Um, so you can see I got a bunch of stuff here. I got clay here. I'm not going to actually do it, but you, you'll get the idea. You know, artists have good imagination, so you can figure it out. Um, but the best thing uh, for you to do right now is to buy this book called Wild Clay. I'm going to show it to you. I have other books here I'll show you, but it, it uh, lays everything out for you. So this is a sort of a primer for that and then uh, overview of it. And then, uh, of course, you can go really deep into it. You know, once you make your clay or get your clay process, it makes stuff. Then you got to get the glazes and stuff like that. So there is a whole process, but uh, hopefully I can do it justice. All right. As always, I am here by myself, me and my invisible friends. And uh, so it's a little bit... Um, I don't know. Could be better if I had a film crew. Let's put it that way. All right. Well, here's a book that, that just came out. Um, it's a fantastic book. And um, there are other books. So I've got a bunch of... I just show you a few books I have. Uh, this, one's this one's actually interesting. It's a kind of a weird one. The Kalen uh, Chalk Wars. Uh, they have some... Let's see, I, I have some pages here. They have some pictures of Kaylin and uh, Mines and uh, all the, you know, so these are just fa all fantastic books. This is a little bit more of glazed material, but those are two versions of Raised in Clay, which talk about the Seagrove uh, and Southern pottery traditions. Um, and then, of course, you can always get geology books. And, and this one here is good. This is a whole series on... Um, uh, geology, uh, this is Tennessee, but there's many states, and what they'll do is they'll show you some outcroppings, talk about it. It's very good. Um, all the stuff I'm showing you is just a beginning to whet your appetite, and then you have to delve into it yourself. Okay, so this book is spectacular for uh, wild clay. So they show a bunch of... Uh, uh, this, they're digging this Mitchfield mine. So they're showing and talking about that. They're showing like cl where clay comes from, samples. They've got fine, how to find clay. It's fantastic, you know. And then they have artist spotlights, which is really good. Uh, I think I put, made a note here in the back. So these are some books they recommend in the bibliography. So, you know, I've talked about a lot of this Val Cushing's book, Hammer's book, Steve Harrison, uh, uh, Cuff, uh, Yvonne Hutchison, and then uh, West and um, Lawrence. These are um, Daniel Rogers. I know Phil Rogers has a new book coming. They're going to redo this book, Ash Glazes, so that's exciting. Uh, anyway, so that helps you a lot. And then the other thing this is good for is it's got a super good glossary. So if you're new to this business, you can just get this glossary and read about all this stuff. And it'll be very helpful for, you know, what is absorption? You can just read it all in here. And they have uh, sheets for you to work on as opposed to what I do is make up a little sheet. And they got an index on things, you know. So like I think there was different clays, ball clays, etc. So, that's a fantastic book. So get that book, that'll get you started. Now, I ran one of their tests here, I'll show you. I've collected my own clay here, which I'll show you in a minute, and I'm gonna show you how I processed it. But for right now, what I'll start with is uh, how to find clay. Now, well, let me just say, first of all, th this is what clay is composed of, clay flux and filler. So you'll, if you really want to do this, you probably want to go back to, to three previous videos. One was on clay itself. One was on the properties of clay and clay bodies. 
And the next one was on actual clay bodies and structure. And so that helped you to set a foundation for this because this is the main thing we'll be talking about when we try to adjust a body that we find in the ground. All right, so how to find a clay. So, so you could go, okay, many ways to start. <laughs> the easiest way is to just be out hiking or something, go to stream beds and creeks or by the seashore, and you, and you can probably find some clay there because clay is sedimentary. And that means it's sort of deposited by water and it'll, uh, it'll deposit in areas. And so there's two, two ways of looking at it. It's a local clay deposits, which you may just find sort of randomly. And then there's regional uh, areas like they call, talk about the Kalen Belt in southern, uh, in the southeastern uh, U.S. And so that was a larger geologic forces when the oceans were in different places and that they would deposit uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, weathered kalins and stuff, uh, and the sea, sh sea, and then as the sea receded, it became, uh, you know, it, it, it came up, and then, uh, this is where, like, say, uh, EPK is, uh, is mined down in Florida, uh, or, or in South Carolina, there's a lot, in, a uh, Alabama and Georgia, there's a whole, bunch of uh, clays there. Now, that takes us to, I, I've jumped a little bit ahead there, but that takes us to another way to find clay. It's like ask your friends and potters. So that maybe, <laughs> maybe you don't have any uh, actual friends. You have friends on Facebook though. Uh, and so on Facebook, there's a group called Wild Clay Club. So that'd be a fantastic thing to get on. There may be somebody in your area or people who can give you advice. And then there's also uh, Facebook pages on natural materials. So I would definitely go on there and start communicating with people. And then I would Google. So, you know, all this stuff I tell you, if you just watch this and, oh, yeah, and, and never do anything, you, you cannot internalize it. What you have to do is go on to Google, uh, type in how to find geologic clay deposits in my area. And all kinds of stuff will come up. And then what you're going to, and it may probably be a geologic survey maps because there's geologic surveys in all the states and you can go there and ask them for maps. Uh, you may find them online. Uh, but I, I might even go there and visit and talk to the, one of the geologists. That could be super helpful to you because you're, you're not the first person looking. All right. And then I might look for historic or recent potters that are doing it. So meaning, uh, there, may, there are probably potters right now uh, digging clay in your area. And you just don't know about it. But there's also probably historic uh, sites there. Like say there was an old clay works or a brick work by you. Uh, so then you would know there was clay in that area. Another thing you can do is just look, get a map and... Uh, plot out where all the clay mines are in the United States, like OM4, Kentucky, Tennessee was a company. Now I think it's, it's owned by somebody else, but might be owned by Emerus or uh, Quartz Corp or something. There are all these multinationals that bought them up, but find out where the EPK mine is. And so if you can find all these and plot them on a map, you'll, you'll probably be able to figure out places near you that would have clay, all right? So that would be a regionally. Okay, so like I said, go to a, maybe the geology department at a university or a community college and talk to those people. Uh, you know, they it may, may not tell you exactly where, but they may give you good ideas about where to find it, all right? So, and then, then as you do this Googling, like I said, of uh, this... Uh, historic potters, you'll find uh, things come up like where the Kalen belt is or where their ball clay deposits. Okay, so when I was doing this preparing for you, I just put in, uh, I just Googled that and I came up with Geology for Potters. It's in Ceramics Monthly. It was an article, I think Linda Bloomfield, and there was a bunch of maps in there d describing the exact same thing I'm talking about. All right, so I already told you about getting this wild clay book. That'll help you quite a bit. And I just will want to say uh, one thing. Make sure if you're going to go on somebody's land, you ask permission because, you know, that's their property and you could get in trouble if you just go on digging on somebody's land. But a lot of times people are very sympathetic. 
All right, so then you're gonna collect some and let it dry out. Now, before I move on, what I wanna say is uh, there's a difference between industrial pottery or say brickworks and studio potter collecting clay because uh, industrial potters uh, or brick makers or um, uh, whoever's getting it whoever's getting it to like the Homer Laughlin or someone they're going to get clay and and treat clay differently than we do so potters are able to get clay, sieve it, add stuff to it, etc. But industrial potters do not want to do any sieving of clay because they're doing millions of pounds. So they run these things through something called a Gleason shredder. So that will smash everything up. So their idea is to find clay that's pretty good as it is and they can use it just directly. But potters, we can uh, get it, sieve it, make bars, add stuff, change the color, etc., because we're doing small amounts. All right, so then what you're going to do is slake it down. That means after you dry it out, you're going to then put it in a bucket of water. Uh, and that will cause it to swell and then it, uh, it, it'll break it up without too much effort. So you just wait a while. And then you'll probably run an immersion blender in it or some kind of mixer to get it into a slurry so that you can screen it. Now, I'm going to show you here what I would do. So here is what I've done. I've collected this clay and I've let it dry out. So it's pretty dry. So now I'm going to put that in one of these buckets with water. Here's another clay. I, I did some in a bucket and some in a bag. So here's another bunch of clay. And uh, so I will slake that down. Now I'm going to wet it up. Uh, and I have these I have these sieves right here. There's a screw, that's a hardware cloth. Here is a window screen. And so I would run, I would pour the bucket uh, in there and, uh, that, that, and do several times, do several different screens. And I have these screens here. I have a 40 mesh, 80, 120, and 200. All right, so once I've sieved it the way I want, and I'll show you here in a second, uh, I'm gonna put it in one of these molds. This is called a fish mold, and it's from Pure and Simple Pottery Products. Uh, this is a plastic mold that I just pour these in, and they're very good for drying things out. You can also just make your own plaster baths. All right, so this is gonna show you then what happened. I took this, this was Asheville clay I got from a creek. And I took a thousand grams and then I sieved it. And you can see that here I got 30 grams out of the, the screen. Then I got 250 grams out of the, the mesh one. And so I got 500 total grams were removed from this clay that I found. So that's not really that good. You're taking out half of what you have collected and, and having to essentially throw it away. So that would probably be not my first bet, but you can do that if you're doing small amounts. And then what I did, I showed you here. Here's, here's how I fired it. I make these shrinkage bars, by the way. Let me just show you that while we're at it. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a bar like this. And what I do is I make a mark here with my, I have a fettling knife. I make a very sharp mark, 10 centimeters. So that way, if this thing shrinks to like nine, I know it's a 10% shrinkage. Uh, and then I can also take this and boil it uh, to do my absorption test. So I'll show you that in a minute. But this was fired at cone 10. This is the raw clay, no sieving, nothing. I just put it on there. I think I fired this to nine and uh, this to six. And this, this was also fired, uh, but I had sieved, I have sieved all this stuff out. So you can see the different color it is when all the stuff is removed. And this were cone 10. Oh, this was raw and this was sieved at cone 10. All right. Okay, maybe that's what it was. Yeah, no, okay. Anyway, you got the idea. You're going to make a lot of these bars, by the way. Because as we add stuff and take stuff out, we're gonna, we're gonna make more bars every time we do it. All right, so then this clay I showed you here, this little reddish kind of clay, I, I have right here. 
And in, in this one, I had 500 grams and I removed this much material. So that was like a little over 200. So this is almost taking out half of it also. Uh, and so, and then uh, I did another type, the other type of clay over there. I had, I only took this one, I only took out less than 100 grams of stuff out of 500. So that was very good. So this was this white kind of clay here. So that might be a good clay to start with. And then, then I said to myself, what if I just sieve this through a 200 mesh sieve and I did that? And you can see that now it's on this. Uh, so I didn't do each, I didn't do, um, I did more sieving than this. So these, this was a screen, a 40 mesh, an 80 mesh, and then this was 200. I didn't think I'd actually get it through there, but I, I did. It really wasn't that hard. I had a talisman sieve. All right, so then I'm going to dry this out and wedge it and try to use it. But I'll probably make another shrinkage bar, you know, as soon as... Oh, here's here they are. I make another shrinkage bar, and then I fired this to 6 and this to um, 10. So this is a great cone 10 clay. This was actually really nice. So, and then another thing I did, which you can or cannot do, uh, like in industry, they have a Gleason a mixer, or I'm sorry, a shredder to, to grind things up. I just put mine in a ball mill, and I ball milled it, and uh, then I got this. Oh, I didn't even pull this out. I got this really nice. This was very nice when I did that because it just it made all the particles. I didn't have to remove anything. I just ground it up. Uh, okay. So that's also going to change your color, too. You'll see the difference when you do stuff like that. And there's also a thing called a hammer mill. Um, oh, a hammer mill. You can do a ball mill or a hammer mill. I know one guy, has a he runs it through a garbage disposal. So he has an old garbage disposal, and he puts it in a bucket, and then he grinds it up that way. And another guy I know was really smart. He had a wood chipper. And then he would put a tarp around it and put clay in there. And then it would spray and it would gradate the particles for him. He'd get coarse in one area, medium and fine. So, you know, there's a million ways to do all this stuff. Uh, but you can do it the least uh, difficult or the you know most difficult, whatever you like. All right, so I did the same thing here then I... Uh, you know, made up my blocks of clay. This was two, sieved through a 200 mesh sieve, so it was pretty good. But this clay is very short, is what we call it. See how it cracks real easy? Uh, this one's pretty plastic. So this short one, I'm going to have to do something, or I can't, I won't be able to use that. But this is it fired to cone 10. That was cone 9. This was cone 6. So this was really good. I think this might have been 10. Yeah, 10. So, uh, and that was probably in some reduction. So this is a very nice clay. It can go very hot. It's a high alumina. Uh, and then I, what I did was I recorded like the shrinkage. I won't go through all of this for you, but what I would do is I would do it at bone dry, cone six, cone nine, et cetera. And I did my absorption too. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. All right, we'll come back to this after I see where I'm at here. So now you're going, you, you wet it up, and then you put it through with an immersion blender or a mixer or something and make it into a slurry, run it through the sieves. So what you're trying to do is take out debris, maybe limestone uh, chunks, which cause pop outs. Okay, and then you're going to dry it out on the plaster molds, like I said, and then you're going to make shrinkage bars with a 10 centimeter line. And then you'll fire it at various cones. 05, cone 6, and cone 10 are just standard that potters use. And I usually do it on drip trays, meaning so that if it melts or does something bad, I won't ruin my shelf. I just put it on a slab of clay. So then I'm going to measure my shrinkage and you can, uh, that's very simple to do. You just measure it. What it was when you started was 10 centimeters and then what it is at the end and subtract it and you'll know how much it, sh it shrank. And you do it at various, uh, you do it at like uh, 
leather hard state when you make your line, then bone dry, bisque fire, and then a bunch of cones, and you'll see how it progressively be becomes more and more shrink shrinkage due to firing. Okay, and then, then you're going to calculate the absorption. What you're going to do is you're going to weigh the tile. So I'm going to take this tile and I'm going to weigh it on a scale. Then I'm going to put it in water. I'm going to boil it for two hours and then let it soak for 24. Then I'll weigh the tile as soon as I get it out. That's going to be my wet weight. So I do my wet weight minus my dry weight divided by dry weight times 100. And that'll be my percent absorption. All right. So you would like to have, you know, one to two percent absorption at cone 10 if you could. Uh, you may have a little more at mid range and more at low fire. So you, just so you you can watch some of those other videos and you'll get an idea. All right. So then we got clay flux and filler. So, but basically all we have is clay. Uh, and so all those things are in there. We can't remove them like we could with a clay body. So kind, we're kind of stuck. But this is what we're going to think about as we're adding stuff. So if my clay is too short, meaning it's not very plastic, then we're going to have to add something to make it more plastic. So you can add. So that's, this is why we, I had those other videos. So you're going to know, oh, what's a plastic clay? Ball clay or bentonite. So I'm going to add a clay to it. And I would keep track of how much I was adding. I usually do a, a, a line blend like I add 90, 10, 80, 20, 70, 30, like that, until I see where it's real good. I'll show you one back here uh, in a second. So it, uh, I can also add a plastic body, wild or store-bought. So sometimes you'll say, oh, this clay is too short. Let me mix it with some clay I got from a supplier like Laguna or High Water or... Um, uh, standard clays, wh wherever you are where they make clay. And I usually, uh, then I will do a line blend and run um, shrinkage bars. So a line blend is like this, 90% of say the short clay, 10% of my store-bought, 80 of the short clay, 20 of the either ball clay or store-bought clay, etc. And I just keep going down until I end up with 10 and then 90 of the uh, the store-bought clay. So th that's the way to do it. And then you just look at all those. You make shrinkage bars. So I say make shrinkage bars, make absorption bars. All right. So now if my clay is too much shrinkage, so it's too plastic uh, or too fine-grained, I then have to add something to uh, stop that. So I'm probably going to add a filler. So I can add, a fire clay can act as a filler because it's very groggy. So I can also add grog, mullite, pyrex, kyanite. There's many things. In those other videos, I told you a bunch of things you could add as grog. Or I'm going to mix another clay with it, just like I said before. So we're going to mix some other wild clay. Or we're, that's short versus... Uh, because we're too plastic here, too much shrinkage, and we're going to add something that's the opposite to blend it out. Then I'm going to make more bars. All right, so now if my clay is not, I've made my uh, absorption bar, and it's, um, it's not vitrified enough. Say it's like 10% uh, absorbing of water. That's not very good. So now what do I need to add to make it... Uh, more vitrified. Yeah, I'm going to add more flux. So what is the flux I can add? Feldspar, a frit, whiting, will last the night, etc. So you can watch that video where I explained all that. And another clay that uh, I can add, I can take another clay that's vitrified uh, or at a lower temperature and then add that. So for instance, I could take my high fire porcelain that is uh, too short and I could add like red art or a low fire clay, a wild clay or store-bought clay and then blend it. Maybe I'll get a cone six clay that way. All right. So I'm going to do my uh, line. Blend. I'll show you the triaxial here in a second. Then you're going to run your shrinkage bars and absorption bars ad, ad nauseum. <laughs> 
All right, so if my clay is too vitrified, I need to add some refractory clay or store-bought clay to, to uh, open it up a little. And if my clay is, for instance, not the right color, then maybe I want to add some either dark or lighter clays, wild clay or store-bought. I can even add oxides, red iron oxide or yellow ochre. All right, so I'll run another line blend and another shrinkage bars, store, uh, absorption bar. All right, so if my clay is not the right texture, say it's too smooth, I might want to add grog just to make it a little more tooth, we call it. Or I could add smooth clay to it to sort of, you know, it's sort of like the Goldilocks. If it's too hard and it's too soft, you get right in the middle. So you can do that by adding smoother clays if it's too coarse. All right, so that's that. Let me make sure I got everything. Okay, another thing you can do if you don't even want to make the entire thing into a clay body, you can make terracage out of your local clay to, uh, you know, put over top of your store-bought clay. So that's another option too. And of course, all this is going to be described in more detail in this book. All right, so what I did was... Let's just, since we're on the topic of color and texture, I ran an ex experiment out of this book which talked about a blending, a triaxial blend. So in this corner I did red clay, this corner I did dark star, so that's from Starworks, and in this corner I did the white clay that I've showed you over here. And, as, and I fired this to bis temperature only. So if I fired to cone tan, it would be hotter. But you see how then you just pick the, maybe you like this color. Then you're going you're gonna to blend these two together. Or maybe I like something up here. So th that's what you do. So uh, let's see. So let's say, for instance, here, now this is an example of what I was just saying. My clay here is very short. That means it's not plastic. So I'm going to add some ball clay. So I found out it was short because I tried to roll out a like a worm here, uh, you know, tie it in a knot. And I, after I got up here, it got to be much pl more plastic. So I had added 5% ball clay, 10, 15, 20. So by the time I got to 30, uh, adding to this clay, it was starting to be plastic. So that's what you can do to fix that up from a, in a wild clay. Uh, then, and then you would mix this in the slurry form before, so I'd make, I'd make everything into a slurry, add my ball clay, and then dry it out on plaster bats. All right, now say my clay wasn't vitrified enough. Say I fired it and it was like 10% absorption. Now I'm going to say, hey, I need to add some feldspar to it. So I did that here and I got 2%, 4%, 6% of a Custer feldspar, 8%. And then I do my shrinkage, my, my absorption bars. It started at 11, and it went down to 7 by the time I had 10% in there. So that's getting better. I could probably do a little more. All right? And these were just examples of glaze then. So that's a next step. I won't talk much about this, but uh, you can see the way the color changes uh, when you ball mill this or sieve it. All right, wow, I think I might have made it. So let me make sure I got everything talked about. Got all my equipment, lots of buckets. There's my blender, and you can get one that you hook on a drill too that works real good. Uh, other people, instead of using these plaster bats like I have, they'll use this, uh, they'll make a, uh, a frame out of a two by four and put, hardware cloth under it and then they'll put a uh, fabric like canvas and then they'll pour their clay into that and that's the way they dry it out so there's a lot of ways all right i think we're done so you go get this book you will see all kinds of ways uh, and they have a lot of inspirational people in the back back here so you can uh see what other people are doing it's very it's very nice and then they're going to show you how they do their... Look how many shrinkage bars. Look how many screens they have. Here's them. Uh, so this is a, going to be a great book for you. All right. I will talk to you later. Go pro dig 
10,000 pounds of clay, process it, and I will see you in the morning.